Advanced computer information systems. Guys, I know this sounds very daunting, but it's just some types of computer information systems or environments um, that the computer information system can operate within. I don't want you to spend too much time here trying to analyze which they are. In a question, they'll simply say they use a network, they have electronic data interchange, or they trade via the internet. And you just need to know that these are available, but what comes with it is additional risks. Some of these risks are already done, whether it be in our cycles or whether it be what we've just covered. So don't also now go and freak out that you're going to have to learn more risks. We're going to look at these and then add to those risks that we've already identified in having a computer information system. Okay, so a network just connects multiple users within the entity. So most of your businesses will operate off a network where everyone can be connected. Okay, so think about something you might be familiar with if you've got fiber or Wi-Fi at home. Then that is ultimately a network once you are connected because you're able to access whatever you need to through that network. Electronic data interchange or electronic funds transfer, you guys would be more comfortable with your EFTs, your electronic fund transfer. But if you consider just that and then link it back to the electronic data interchange, it's nice because it's easy for you to make the connection. It connects two people, a third party with someone within the entity. So think about an EFT, connects you to the bank, so that a payment can take place. So electronic data interchange is any kind of other operating system where you are connected to a customer or a client. Okay, and often this happens with um, your suppliers. You might have a direct connection to the supplier where orders can be placed on a system and the supplier then can go and follow up and follow through with the order instead of you phoning and placing an order or emailing. There's a, a, a full-on connected system where you can place your orders. Okay, just like an EFT, fully connected to the bank to make that payment. So it's no longer now just within the entity like a network is. We're going outside of the entity, but there is a link that only you and that third party have access to. Okay, the internet is like a network but it is global and unlimited connections which are obviously limited by your access controls usernames and passwords but ultimately everyone is using the same mechanism to connect being that internet okay so obviously guys we know having just said that that there's unlimited connections it's a global network there are going to be more risks here than just a network within a company. Okay, because huge potential for hackers to get involved here and gain access to information they shouldn't have access to. Okay, a database, one central area for where data is stored and then distributed. So guys, think about you guys, X or you gain access from UNISA through your My UNISA. The UNISA site will hold all the information and they'll send to you individually the data that you need. Okay, and you can't necessarily discuss it with the other people or gain access with other people on My UNISA because you've been limited to just that database. And then a service bureau is where they outsource the computer information system to a third party. So they don't manage it at their site. Somebody else has it and they do the processing that is required for the company. Okay, often a service bureau would be used to do something like your payroll or maybe your taxes. Not necessarily the entire computer information system because that's going to be a lot of work to have all your orderings, all your revenue, and so on. So generally, sections of what is required to be on the computer information system would be outsourced. Okay, so let's go look at the risks for each of these. So, 
Where we've already done our control, I've put it down. We don't have to worry about those. It's already knowledge you have. So if we are looking at a network or an electronic messaging system on internet, we're looking at the same risks here because all of these connect people. The network only connects within the business. Electronic messaging system is a network that connects two parties. However, one is now external. So a little bit more complicated than just the network. And then your internet connects loads of people. Um, and so big risks there. So I've said, yeah, what are the risks? Well, first risk is unauthorized access because there is now sharing of information through the different mechanisms. So there could be unauthorized changes of data, there could be breach of confidential information because somebody's hacking and gaining access they shouldn't. So obviously our key control that we already know is going to be the access controls. Usernames and passwords, and we have already discussed whenever I say username and password, I need to discuss that there needs to be a control over inactivity and a control over incorrect attempts. There are some new controls now. So, if we are communicating outside of the entity, then you could have a dial back system. And that means that I send the message to the third party, the bank, or to the supplier, I need to put through an order, and then the bank or the third party, whoever we're dealing with, will then call you back into the system in order to get the information you need. So they don't automatically get it, so that means that if you've got the information, it's protected because it doesn't come through your communication to them, it only gets access through their communication back to you. And that's how we protect it because that's when we make sure that it really is that third party who's calling us back. Okay, and it's not really a phone call, it's actually a call back through that electronic environment that they're using. Okay, another thing what they can do is they can encrypt data which is ultimately having a password on the data that is moving through that system or moving through that channel. Okay, so that only the person who has that password, which should be the authorized person, can now access that data. A very general thing and very important for internet is to have firewalls. Once again, another security measure to make sure it's only the authorized personnel who are gaining access to this information. And then we've got our standard risks. The fact that they could crash and lose data, backups will address that. And remember, we discussed previously, we need three generations and we need the latest off-site. Virus, having antivirus. Lack of an audit trail, your logs will address that. I have then specifically brought an EFT on its own. So first of all, all of the risks above on the previous slide are relevant. And then obviously all the controls on the previous slide are relevant. But now I've got a additional controls because the risk with an EFT now is specific. It's not just that any kind of information could get lost or stolen. It's bank, it's cash, it's money that they have that could get stolen through fictitious payments. So they have to have additional controls to those above. They need to have the access controls, who can access the EFT area. They need to have antivirus, they need to have backups of their data, but now specifically they need additional. So I've said, all the controls that are relevant in the purchase cycle are now relevant here. 
So having that pre-numbered, pre-printed EFT request that needs to be authorised by two se senior personnel and then the EFT being released by two authorising personnel. So those we've already done from the purchaser cycle. So in addition to all of those, they can add more controls, like one-time passwords. Okay, and that often happens. Most of you will see when you try and access your bank account so that you can make a payment, you will have to put in a one-time password in order to gain access to make that payment. Okay, the bank will SMS you a password. And you put it in and you can gain access. They want to make sure that it is you that is going to be making the payments out of this bank account. They can implement a few restrictions or limits which can help with that. So things like the following restrictions. EFTs can only be made from a designated terminal. So a designated computer, maybe it's from your financial director's computer. Only that computer can make EFTs. And maybe EFTs can only be made at a specific time and day. So EFTs are only made on a Friday at 2 o'clock. Okay, so now we're making sure that anybody else trying to process an EFT any other day, it's not going to happen. Okay, because we know the FD has allocated this specific time and day to the work. They could have a limit in terms of a rand amount for EFT payments. It's only up to 500 rand that EFT payments can be made. Or they have a limit on where they get paid from, so maybe only EFTs can be made from a suspense account. So EFTs can't be made from their full bank account. They've got to put it into a suspense account, almost like a holding account, and that's where an EFT will be made. So that, that limit of 500, whatever, is kept because that's the amount, the maximum amount that can be in a suspense account anyway. We said it above with dial back communication, so perhaps they can limit the EFT to only taking place once the bank has dialed back. And finally, I would add that they could have a bank recon, which would be reconciling their bank statement to what's in their bank accounts in their computer information system to help pick up if there are EFT payments that are taking place that shouldn't be. Okay, so if your question is specific to EFTs, you want to add all of the controls above plus these controls. If it's a risk question, you want to add all the risks above plus this risk of fictitious payments being made. And again, like I've done with EFTs singling out, I've also gone and singled out trading over the internet. So once again, all of the risks above on the first slide are relevant and so are all of the controls. But now I've got some additional risks and therefore additional controls. So an additional risk, guys, always remember this. It's one easy mark. If they're trading over the internet, there is a risk of non-compliance with the Electronic Communications and Transaction Act. I bet you you're going to forget and then you're going to see it and you're going to shout at yourself because I said to remember, it's a standard mark, you don't have to know anything else. But if they're over the internet, there is an Electronic Communications and Transactions Act that they have to comply with. So how do they comply with it in terms of controls? They need to understand the requirements and then adhere to the requirements of this Electronic Communications and Transaction Act. We've got to risk that information that's keyed in by the customer placing an order over the internet is inaccurate or incomplete. So 
they need to have screen aids to assist them with those. The specific type of screen aid I've said over here is mandatory fields. But other kind of screen aids to assist making sure that they do put in everything they need to would be your minimum entry. Helping to bring information that the system has in without the customer putting it in itself. And then your program checks. Missing data, so the same as mandatory field but without the actual asterisk to remind them. And the sequence checks. Okay, that pre-numbered documents and the sequencing of it will help to identify if documents have not been processed or followed up on. Okay, an order and delivery of the goods could be sent to a fictitious customer. So if they put access controls with username and passwords that verify the customer's details to the master file, they should make sure that it is the correct delivery address so that they are delivering to the correct customer. Okay, so again, access controls we've already done. Incorrect pricing, they must make sure that they have an authorized price list and any master file amendments to that must be authorized. And if the website's not user-friendly, it must be user-friendly. They must have a help function to help them with it. Okay, again, all of these we've seen before, it's now just about making them applicable to the specific risks of trading over the internet. And then lastly, the only system we haven't done is if there's a service bureau, so they are now relying on somebody else to do and manage their computer information system. So once again, we've got risks of unauthorized access and our access controls, usernames and passwords should restrict who gets access to what in that service bureau. And remember, username and passwords, those two risks always apply, inactivity and incorrect passwords. There could be a breach of confidentiality. And so now there needs to be confidentiality clauses. in the agreements with this service bureau to ensure that if there is any breach that there will be a consequence for that. Okay, loss of data, backups and antivirus standard. Computer information system is incorrectly programmed on their side and they are managing it. They need to make sure they've got the necessary general controls. Their staff are not trained, their staff have to be trained. Again, one of those general controls with the system development and program changes. There's a risk of the costs. It's more expensive to maybe outsource than it would be to do it in-house. There's no control over that, but it's a cost versus benefit. The risk that they don't meet the deadlines, well, they have to have time requirements in the contract and penalties if they don't meet them because this could have a knock-on effect on maybe the preparation of your financials, the audits, and so on. And that is your advanced computer information systems. So just to be aware, it's all the controls we already know, it's all the risks we already know, and then there are some specific for each of the different ways in which they choose to operate their computer information system. So I've just put together a little summary of where we are now before we move on to the next topics. So we now have a complete understanding of the entity and its environment as well as now the internal control for whichever information system they have. Whether they have a computer information system or a manual system. So we are able now to go and identify the risks of material misstatements as a result of the entity and its environment, so the inherent risks that come here, and then the control risks that come here because we understand internal control, whichever system they have. And now what do we need to do? We need to respond to these risks. 
we need to action the audit plan because of the risks we have identified from our understanding. Before we get into that, guys, let's go into ISA 315 revised and see what information the standard has with regards to understanding the internal control and now specifically computer information systems because we skimmed over that previously and then we can start with the new standards and the actioning of the plan.